This is Newsroom on SABC News. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg in South Africa. My name is Evan Janssen. The show, of course, live and broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube as we speak for the entire show, then available on our YouTube channel all of the time. Now, today, we shift our attention to Nigeria with more lives lost in bloody attacks in that country. We also then cross to Parliament for an update as the fifth sitting continues its work in this country. And we ask the question, what makes the difference with parenting and teaching that actually works? First, let's start with our top stories. Government says it has preparations well in hand for Jacob Zuma's second inauguration as president of the country. The ceremony will take place at the union buildings in Pretoria on Saturday. Yesterday, Zuma was elected unopposed as president of the country by the new National Assembly. He was the only nominee for the position. The Democratic Alliance did object to his nomination, but Chief Justice Mukheng Mukheng swiftly overruled the party's objection. On Sunday, the president is expected to announce his choice of cabinet ministers. A Johannesburg Labour Court judge has been praised for her efforts in persuading mine workers union AMCU and platinum producers to start a new round of talks at an undisclosed location. Previous interventions and months of talks have failed with parties still far apart. There is renewed hope that the strike on the platinum belt will come to an end. Talks began yesterday and will continue until tomorrow. The Fana Bafana coach, Gordon Ingerson, has lamented having international friendlies for his team on days that are not FIFA sanctioned. This after he was forced to make four more changes to his squad for the Australasian tour because of the unavailability of replacements. South Africa will travel to Australia and New Zealand for friendly matches next week with an embattled coach and a severely depleted side. Nigerian protesters have taken to the streets of Abuja demanding an end to a spate of violence in the northern parts of that country. This after suspected Nigerian militants killed 17 people in a remote northeastern village, that of Alagarno, hours after a bomb killed 118 people in the central city of Jos on Tuesday. Boko Haram has been blamed for the two car bombs that tore through the market. The attack took place barely 30 kilometers from Chibok where the militant group abducted more than 200 schoolgirls last month. The protesters questioned the government's handling of the recent violence. They also say that something is wrong with the country's security network. Two car bombs exploded at a bustling bus terminal and market in Nigeria's central city of Jos on Tuesday. 118 people were killed. Dozens were wounded, leaving the streets strewn with bloodied bodies. So far, nobody has claimed responsibility for the twin car bombs, but they bore the hallmarks of Boko Haram, the Islamist extremist group that abducted nearly 300 schoolgirls last month and has repeatedly targeted bus stations and other locations where large numbers of people gather in its campaign to impose Islamic law on Nigeria. The bombing followed after Nigerian police announced plans to beef up security at the country's boarding schools in direct response to the kidnapping of more than 200 girls by the group last week. Boko Haram, which has been fighting a five-year insurgency to create a hardline Islamic state in predominantly Muslim northern Nigeria, attacked schools even before the kidnapping of the girls in Chibok. Borno State on April the 14th. In February, more than 40 boys at a boarding school in the northeastern state of Yorbe, northeast Nigeria, were killed in their beds when militant, fight and law militant fighters launched an attack. Now, political analyst Richard Iroanya joins us from our studio in Pretoria. Good morning to you, uh, uh, Richard. Thank you for joining us once again. Thank you. Good morning. Has the president in Nigeria... We've seen another, uh, another attack. Now, has the security forces and the president, are they starting to lose control in northeastern Nigeria, and is it spreading to the rest of the country? Oh, well, um, uh, to answer this question, I have to you know, draw your mind back uh, uh, before the uh, recent increase uh, in the activities of Boko Haram. We have had just cri crisis for a very long time. And... Uh, 
uh, uh, we, we are blaming Flani Hansman you know, as being responsible for those attacks in Jaws for a very long time. And uh, 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 although the deployment of the Joint Tax Force in, uh, in, in Jaws uh, 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 to a, a very reasonable extent uh, uh, prevented uh, uh, in the, the increase in the violence and the attention shifted uh, to northeastern parts of the country where Boko Haram has uh, uh, has uh, uh, has ruled as laws you know, for some time now. So the just crisis has always been there. And what Boko Haram, I think, have done, if they are responsible for the recent attack, they have tried to use the diversionary tactics to remove the attention of the nations from the northeastern part of the country to come to just. So I do not see it as a spreading of the violence, because the violence in just has been an ongoing issue for a very long time. So it, did, it didn't just start yesterday. So the government is still in control. And with the coming in of the international team, uh, we are seeing that uh, uh, Boko Haram activities has not uh, uh, increased again uh, in, uh, in, in the northeastern part of the country, Brano State and Medjugorje, and the surrounding uh, uh, in cities and towns. So the government is still in control. That's my contention here. We see the people taking to the streets in Abuja protesting against this now, protesting against the lawlessness that's going on. Do you get a sense that the people in Nigeria are losing patience? Of course, we are losing patience uh, uh, with the government and especially with the military. And if you receive, and uh, uh, the anger of the nation is not actually with the with the president; it is with the uh, uh, with uh, with the Nigerian military because the military has become compromised. And the recent American team that came in said they would not share any intelligence with the Nigerian military. Why? Because they think that the military is, is compromised. The, the Boko Haram uh, 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 members have infiltrated the, uh, 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 the Nigerian military. So there is, there is a kind of loss of confidence you know, in the Nigerian military. And also, people are also pleading for, the, for support because the opposition has not been helping the matter. So over the years, they have tried to use insightful statements, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to indirectly sponsor uh, uh, Boko Haram. Because when you make statements that are supportive of their activities, you are, of course, invariably supporting them. And so uh, Nigerians, are, of course, are not happy with what is happening, and they want an immediate action. But a ter fighting terrorist organization is not a fight, uh, you know, you fight conventionally, because these are people who dress like ordinary human beings who just strike, disperse, and mingle with the population again, and that they're very difficult to trace. So this is what is making this very difficult. But we hope that the situation will soon come under control. Are the Nigerian military and government, are they putting plans in place to deal with this problem they have within their own military? Uh, well, I think we have seen that uh, 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 the general who was responsible for commanding the troops in, uh, in the northeastern part of the country has been removed um, because of uh, uh, the tactical uh, uh, deficiencies. And, uh, and uh, we are also seeing that there is an ongoing arrest of certain military personnel who are sus suspected of being, uh, 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 of being sympathetic to Boko Haram cause. And uh, we think that uh, this is part of the plan to make sure that uh, uh, the situation uh, in the north, uh, northeastern part of the country uh, is resolved. And we also believe that with the coming in of international assistance, that uh, much improvement will be done. So definitely there are plans on the, that, there are plans that the government is making, but this is not meant public. We've only th seen, seen uh, the military activities going on. But at the back also, I think the government has also opened the door for dialogue with uh, uh, Boko Haram. Uh, especially uh, with respect to rescuing uh, uh, the Chimbu girls. What about the Paris summit that went on recently, or that concluded recently, uh, and the ECOWAS group uh, within West Africa? Do we see a scenario where all of the neighboring countries are talking a good game, but they're not really supporting Nigeria in this fight against Boko Haram? What's your view on that? Yes, I think there, you know, like what I have always said, Nigeria is the giant uh, uh, there in West Africa, and even in Africa, if you like. Um, so when a problem happens in neighboring countries like we had in Syria alone, like we had in Liberia, uh, you had in uh, Ivory Coast, Nigeria played a prominent role. And uh, that's because of its economic resources, military power, and, uh, and what have you. But the neighboring countries do not have the wherewithal at the disposal of Nigeria, you know, to play active role. And this must be understood. I think they have also done their part by, you know, pledging support 
sharing of intelligence. But I think they can also do more. If it means uh, if it means deploying their own forces to join the to, to join this the search, these are kind of uh, actions that we would like to see our neighboring countries take. Cameroon, for example, has also been deeply involved. Uh, in fact, the first agreement that was signed, international agreement that was signed, Cameroon was involved, France was involved, Chad was involved, and these are the areas that Boko Haram, you know, uh, you know. Uh, uh, is operating, and the borders along those areas are porous. So if, they, if, if uh, the West African countries can come together to police the border areas, uh, you know, where Boko Haram uh, uh, members have been using. And then, of course, we can see, uh, well, well, we, we can see a quick resolution of the problem in the in northeastern part of the country. Thank you very much for joining us today, uh, Richard. That's a political analyst. Thank you for having Richard me. Richard Aranya joining us from Pretoria, giving his views on what's going back well, what's going on in Nigeria, of course, his country of birth. Now, just to recap, or let's look at a top story. Cabinet will brief the media tomorrow on his preparations for the inauguration of uh, President Jacob Zuma. Thousands of people are expected to attend the ceremony, which will take place at the Union Buildings in Pretoria on Saturday. Yesterday in Parliament, Zuma was sworn in as the country's fifth democratic president. A mere formality. The ANC's president was the president in waiting. On behalf of the African National Congress and millions of South Africans, nominate Honorable Jacob Ketesekisa Zuma. Is that a nomination? The motion was seconded. I, Ngosiake Amos Masondo, rise to second the motion as tabled by MP Stori Morutwa. To have Honorable J.G. Zuma elected as President of the Republic of South Africa. As I leave. Predictably, the DA objected. We object to the nomination of Mr. Jacob Zuma. Thank you, uh, the motion was dismissed, but it is traditionally a jovial atmosphere. <laughs> and even the Chief Justice displayed a sense of humor. Looks like Honorable Malema is. Uh... is signaling his availability. <laughs> president Zuma will be inaugurated on Saturday. He will then begin his second and last term as president of the country. On Sunday, the president will announce his choice of cabinet ministers. Mzondi Limbej, SAPC News. The National Council of Provinces, NCOP, is one of the two houses of parliament and came into effect in 1997. The NCOP is constitutionally mandated to ensure that provincial interests are taken into account in the national sphere of government. This is done through participation in the national legislative process and by providing a national forum for consideration on issues that affect the provinces. Yesterday, the nine provincial legislatures met to nominate the 90 members who will represent provinces in the national parliament. Now, our political reporter, Lukanyo Kalata, joins us from Parliament once again. Good morning, Lukanyo. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, well, good morning. Just give us a quick heads up. Uh, what's the expectation of today, Lukanyo? All right, Eben, today is the second of two big days on our calendar here in Parliament. Uh, today is the swearing-in of the 54 permanent delegates of the National Council of Provinces. As you rightly mentioned uh, in your intro, the uh, NCOP uh, consists of a total of 90 members, but only 54 of those are permanent, and uh, th those permanent ones will be sworn in by the Chief Justice today. He will then uh, preside over the election of a chairperson for the NCOP, and then the chairperson will then uh, take over from the Chief Justice uh, to preside over the election of his or her uh, deputy chairperson uh, for the National Council of Provinces. Now, the 36 remaining um, members of the, 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 the NCOP, they are referred to as special delegates, and they are appointed by their provincial legislatures, and uh, they are only sent to uh, the National Council of Provinces uh, as and when they are required to by their provincial legislatures. So uh, a, a process very similar to what we saw yesterday taking place in the National Assembly. It's just that today it's taking place for the second House of Parliament, which is, of course, uh, the National Council of Provinces. Yeah, but
I, I want to take you back to yesterday quickly before we uh, continue, look, Tanya. Uh, we saw Honorable Malema sitting in Parliament there with uh, a group dressed in red. They caused quite a stir yesterday uh, with the uniforms especially that they wore into Parliament. Just tell us the experience that you made and, and the sort of reaction from everyone else to this new group in Parliament. I think we're going to play some of the pictures as well. Well, Eben, yes, yesterday morning when they came in, obviously I think it was almost like a little bit of a, of a, a you know, of, of, of a rock, a, a bunch of rock stars coming into Parliament because you had all the parliamentary staff, you know, the guys, the cleaners, the, the, the painters who, who were here uh, tidying up, uh, doing last-minute touch-ups. They were obviously very excited to see the economic freedom fighters in their red overalls. And, uh, you know, it was just a very um, uh, electric buzz around uh, around the precinct, which is not something that we used to, you know, we used to suits and ties and uh, uh, the ladies dressed up in very uh, uh, smart dresses and, and, and all those kinds of things. Obviously, in the House, we, you know, the EFF had said they, that uh, they are going to come dressed in the, in the red uh, overalls. And then they came yesterday, and we were a little bit surprised, uh, we, because, and also we didn't know what exactly uh, uh, was going to happen. Were, will they be asked to go and change their, their, their attire? Because obviously party insignia and party colours are not uh, allowed in the, 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 the chambers of parliament. But I think they, they, they managed to get away with that, largely because there wasn't really a speaker for the, the much part of the swearing-in ceremony. So the speaker couldn't then really uh, uh, deal with them and say, look, that's not allowed in the House. When the Speaker was then um, uh, duly elected, or was, was uh, elected, I think the, uh, she had other things on her mind, which was obviously uh, the election of uh, her deputy, and then uh, to invite the, the, the Chief Justice back onto uh, the, to preside over the ceremony for the election of the President. I'm not sure if they'll be able to get away with it again, but obviously that remains to be seen, Yevon. Absolutely. Interesting times ahead in Parliament. Lacanya, just want to ask you, complaints in the past about the NCOP have been that ministers sometimes undermine it a little bit and that they don't always attend oversight committee meetings. Does, does this house have, have real power? Does it have teeth? Uh, Eben, yes, it does. I think, obviously, because, look, the, the National Council of Provinces and the, uh, the National Assembly, when they are put together, they then constitute parliament. So no bill ever comes through and goes through to the president for assent or to be signed into law unless it has the approval of the National Council of Provinces. I'll make you an example. Last year we had the Protection of State Information Bill. Uh, once it was passed by the National Assembly, it came to the National Council of Provinces and the NCOP, they weren't exactly happy with it, you know, so they tinkered with the bill a little bit, they held their own uh, uh, public hearings and then only once they were satisfied did they then obviously send it back to the national uh, to the national assembly and say look these are the areas that we fixed these are the areas that we weren't satisfied with the national council of provinces does have uh, a significant powers here and, and um, I think what I, I think the, in this term, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that that the corridor talk has been about was that the house just will assert itself a little bit more than it has in the future. So we look forward to seeing um, just what uh, the, the 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 NCOP will be able to do over the next uh, coming five years. Eben. thank you very much for joining us today, Lucanio. Political reporter Dan at Parliament in Cape Town, Lucanio Kalata, giving us an update what's happening with the NCOP today. Of course, he'll keep us updated on what's happening throughout the rest of the day. So on all of our platforms, if you want to know what's happening in Parliament, Lucanio is a man. Let's take a quick look now at uh, well, what's happening on the front pages of the world. Nigerian newspapers are still focusing on the back-to-back -back bomb blasts earlier this week that killed 118 as well as the latest on the situation with the abducted schoolgirls. This while the Daily Telegraph in Australia is reporting that the state's army of disability pensioners has hit record levels. Those are some of the headlines coming to you from some of the newspapers around the world. Let's take a quick look at what you are saying. Remember, we love your comments. We want you to interact with us. It's at SABC Newsroom. If I put it up, we'll see it. Uh, yeah, just some of your comments coming in.
We should not forget our daughters still held hostage. We must keep hope alive for them and their families. There you have uh, uh, Aliko Abu Bakas with a picture of her daughter. Uh, bring back our girls, hashtag Kumark. Say For this woman, every effort, tweet and demonstration to bring back our girls matters immensely. Let's not get tired. What a sad story this is indeed. If you're a father or a mother, think about it. What would you do if your child was just kidnapped and sold into slavery? Unbelievable. Atika Abu Bakr says the faculty and students of a in Nigeria and AN Academy are lending their voices. Yes, the world is lending its voice. Here we have uh, Hollywood lending its voice. Skiri Traffic, that's of course Ms. Osborne and a whole host of other celebrities. Day 37, bring back our girls. Dot US. That's from Ramar Mosley. It's been 37 heartbreaking days since 273 schoolgirls were kidnapped in Nigeria. In this day and age. In this day and age. Can you believe that? girls kidnapped from school. It's, it's amazing that in 2014 this kind of thing still happens. Well, we're going to take a short commercial break. When we come back, we talk education, you and your child. Don't go away. This is Newsroom on SABC News. Kenyan actress is the first from her country to win an Academy Award. Her Best Actress Oscar win has inspired many in Kenya. Nyongo's victory has made the headlines in all of the country's newspapers. This was Nyongo's first role in a film after she had completed postgraduate studies in America. Players in South Africa's music industry will attend the music exchange program in Cape Town, South Africa. We as Africans, we have to embrace what is unique about us and about our music. That's Afro Showbiz News, Saturdays, 7.30 p.m. on SABC News. Zoom into Africa. This is Senegal. The president is Mr. Macky Sall. Senegal withdrew from the Mali Federation on 20 August in 1960. The population is more than 13 million people. One of the major languages spoken is French. Monetary unit is CFA. Welcome back. You're with Newsroom here on SABC News. Parents and teachers better listen up. Ever wish children came with an instruction manual? Well, maybe they do. Have you ever wondered what makes the difference between parenting and teaching that actually works and parenting teaching that fails? Well, according to the Gordon Training International Institute, the factor that contributes the most is the quality of the relationship between the parties involved parent and teacher effectiveness training are both separate programs that offer parents and teachers the essential communication and conflict resolution skills they need to have high quality relationships with children. We are joined today on our show by the international master trainer Mr. Steve Emmons. He's worked in 34 countries and he's here in South Africa training effectiveness training in structures from the Gordon Training International Institute. Good morning to you, sir, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm a parent myself, so, so this really resonates. It hits, it, hits home. it really resonates with me. Just, just tell us about what your methodology is really all about. Well, being a parent and a teacher, as, as you know, being a, is, is difficult and hard work and oftentimes unappreciated. So what we do is provide support to parents and teachers, help them to listen better so their kids will talk and talk so their kids will listen and be able to solve conflicts that they have in the, in the schools or the, or, the, or the home. In South Africa, we have, we, or we seem to have a problem where, where after school hours, parents are not really that involved mm. in their children's schooling. Mm. How do you change that with this kind of training then? 
Well, it, it's not easy. That's why we have parent effectiveness training uh, to help parents begin to understand the importance of their relationship with their students. Uh, it isn't, I mean, their, their children, because it isn't just about the teachers taking care, but the parents. It starts with parents. It starts at home. We also, have, we, the, the big, one of the big points of discussion in South Africa uh, in recent times have been corporal punishment, mm -hmm. because it's been a big part of South Africa until freedom about 20 years mm -hmm. ago. And, and then when we came back, we stopped corporal punishment. And now today, parents tell me, and this is just from my group with my children being both in high school and in junior school, they tell me that discipline is severely lacking in mm -hmm. schools mm -hmm. because there's no more corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. Now, in your travels around the world, is that the case everywhere? And, or is corporal punishment a myth? Well, corporal punishment is using power and, and pressure, and it's external discipline. And certainly what happens is we're used to two things, either power, authoritarian, or permissive. And I think with corporal punishment being gone, um, then people shift to permissive, and, yeah. and that's not good either. So what we're trying to do is give them a third option. A third I want you to have a look. At, at one of the clips that made real headlines mm -hmm. here around South Africa because of that, of the, the supposed lack of discipline mm -hmm. or the lack of respect for the relationship. But just have a look at this and give us an opinion. This is what happened uh, <laughs> months ago, last year, I think, uh, when a teacher was actually attacked with a broom by a student that's totally out of control. Mm -hmm. And, and the teacher actually had to walk away. The child actually ran behind the teacher with the broom. Uh, I know it's on cell phone video, but this sort of gives you an idea of the kind of challenges that teachers face in South Africa. How, how do you deal with that kind of scenario, or is that a, a scenario where we're too far down the road? Well, I think the teacher leaving was the best thing he could do at the moment, uh, mm. but certainly the issue is that's a symptom, and I think we need to, to go back, as you said, and build stronger relationships with students, and we need to have develop internal discipline instead of the, the former external discipline with corporal punishment. Corporal punishment... Uh, I want to talk about it a little bit. Is there a place for corporal punishment within the schooling system still, in, in your opinion? I think we need to change. I think it, it's violence brings violence. And uh, he had some models, obviously, <clears throat> the student did about giving violence. So we need to change. I think we need to take it out. Many countries now are beginning to shift away from that. Let's talk about the role of the parent. Uh, in, in, in many ways, teachers in South Africa are overwhelmed, classrooms are quite big. How important then in, in, in the 21st century is the role of the teacher uh, in, in, in bringing your child th successfully through mm. the schooling process? Well, teachers suddenly become disciplinarians and mediators, and they've lost the, their main focus, which is to teach uh, information subjects. So it's critical uh, that teachers... Uh, redefine their job, but also they get support from parents because they can't do it alone. They have to work together as a team. How do you instill that culture, though? Little by little. It's, it's slow change. Uh, in the courses that we have, uh, we get some parents and some teachers. They begin to see the benefits. They have some new ways of approaching, and they spread that in their classrooms and their families. So it's, it's a movement that way. You have to have people who come back and say, this works, this is better. Yeah. I'm feeling better as a parent or a teacher. And, and how, just tell us about your visit now. How are you going to implement? Where will you be doing some of your work? And, and who will be able to attend? Sure. We just finished, I just finished training a group of instructors that will teach teacher effectiveness training and a group also that will teach another course called youth effectiveness. And that course is directly aimed at the students to help them begin to take responsibility for their own behaviors. So we've trained these new instructors, the first in South Africa, and their plans are to go out and begin to have an impact. Fantastic. I really think South Africa needs the work that you're doing. Uh, we need a new take on, mm. on, on the relationship between the teacher, the parent, and the student. Uh, at some times, I think we're a little bit lost. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate the chance to be here. That's uh, International Master Trainer Steve Emmons joining us today on, uh, on Newsroom. Now, it's almost a year uh, since the Bloemfontein teacher Pierre Corky was kidnapped by Al-Qaeda in the Yemen. His wife, Yolandi, says she hopes he will be released soon. Yolandi was released in January and instructed to raise her husband's 30 million rand ransom. She released a second video yesterday pleading with the group to release Corky, who she says is seriously sick. On the 25th of February, Yemen tribal leaders confirmed Pierre Corky was still alive. 
Since then, there's been no word on his condition. Now, another plea for mercy from his wife. With the coming month of Ramadan, the month of mercy and forgiveness, we ask you to please have mercy on Pierre and release him unconditionally as you released me. Pierre has not harmed anybody. He's an innocent man and a respected teacher. My children and I long desperately for him. Please release him. We will be so grateful. Yulandi also thanks South Africans for their assistance and says her family won't give up hope. I wish to also express my gratitude to South Africa from governmental level, gift of the givers, friends and family, the public as well as the media. Thank you for your support, your prayers and compassion. Thank you to God Almighty for sustaining us in this difficult time. Gorky and his wife were kidnapped on the 27th of May last year. This is the second video she's released. In February, she recorded a two-minute video in which she pleaded for her husband's release. I'm pleading for you, with you to please release my husband, Pierre. Stefina Komane, SABC News. Of course, we'll have a special focus uh, next week on the Corky case. So if you want to be up to date with the very latest, stay on this channel. We'll keep you updated as to what's happening there. Time now for us to take a look at what's been happening in the online news and social media space. Joining me is SABC Digital News, digital media specialist, Tegan Bedser. Good morning, Tegan. Thanks Good. for joining us. Good morning. Thank you so much, Eben. That was a mouthful, actually. It is quite a mouthful. <laughs> I just tell people that we do all the fun stuff. Yeah, you do. You do, you do, you do great stuff, actually. Now, of course, the election's over and it's inauguration. Uh, That's right. Topping the headlines, I'm sure, f uh, right sure. into the weekend. And, and, and there must be a lot of stuff that you guys are going to be putting together. Absolutely. We're doing tons of stuff. And even though you, right, you rightly said that elections are over, it's still very much at the top of, of the minds of everyone. And um, our fifth Democratic president will be inaugurated on Saturday. We've got a team there mm -hmm. well, who will be in Pretoria on Saturday covering the event. And our, our viewers and our users can, can log on to our website, um, www.sabc.co.za forward slash news, mm -hmm. to, to get access to our special report on the inauguration. And we're going to have such great content there and coverage. So we've got some historical information. So you can view things like Madiba's inauguration, for example. Yeah. But you can also then view multimedia. There's going to be live stream coverage from the um, formal proceedings right to the cultural event later in the afternoon. We've got some, some special highlights as well, which includes a road closure map, which I'm sure our viewers will find great use of. Yeah. So, we've, so on the map, you'll be able to see the, the traffic spot control points which will, well, for our viewers who don't know, and there are residents in the area, they need to produce municipal, their municipal accounts as proof yeah. that they do live in the area. But we've got the road closures mapped out for Friday and for Saturday, and it's, it's a very, very useful tool. And we also have, well, this is available now, actually, so if our viewers go to our special report, there, yeah. is, a, there is a promo button on our homepage, so they can, they can spot it easily. There's also a live blog, is there? That's and, right. And, and people can interact with that directly? They, they will be, it, it'll be interactive, yeah. so it'll give rolling coverage on the day. So on, this will only be available on the Saturday. Yeah. So there will be um, social media conversations, multimedia brought into it, but we're going to have um, our team taking control of that and, and giving all that live And then we're live streaming the inauguration itself That's and all right. of that sort of stuff. Yes. Uh, on our YouTube channel, people That's can correct. go to SABC, or is it digital SABC? They can go to... SABC Digital News. They can go to SBC Digital News, you're right. Otherwise, the other URL is youtube.com forward slash SABC News. But di SABC Digital News will also get you to the same uh, place. And there you can get, you'll see a lot of detail that you probably wouldn't yes. be able to to access elsewhere. Yeah? Absolutely. Last, or well, not last, but rather yesterday, mm -hmm. we had the swearing-in ceremony. That's still available. So we've been doing, we've continued with all the election-related coverage. They can get tons and tons and tons of updates, news bulletins, live stream coverage on our channel. So it's all there. It's all available. And um, other election-related um, news that we've been keeping our, our yeah. users and viewers updated with are, uh, well, right from the beginning, from the gazetted list of representatives straight yeah, through the, to the swearing-in. Parliament uh, yesterday yes. swearing-in. Uh, that That's caused quite a stir. It Everybody did. loved the, the oh, red. They do. The red overalls. Yes. And Julius Malema being available. I'm sure, As well, that, that was I'm sure people must have had point. a lot to say on, 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 in the comments section. But yes. <clears throat> let's move on from, from Parliament now and, mm. and, and let's move to Oscar Pistorius right. going to mental observation on Monday and, and uh, just mm. tell us how people can access information if they want that. Definitely. They can 
keep track of everything on Oscar on our special report on our website. So once again, visit our, our website, go to the special report. Even though he's only going to be appearing in court again on June 30th, you, we'll keep our, um, our readers, our users, our viewers updated with all the latest developments. And um, if you've missed any of the any of the live stream coverage, it's also available on our YouTube channel. We've got a play, an Oscar playlist. Yeah. So bulletins, live stream coverage. If you missed Tuesday's ruling, you are welcome to visit it again and um, or visit our YouTube channel and um, check it out. Now, there's something that uh, uh, a lot of young ladies in South Africa are can't wait to happen. That's uh, uh, trending, I think, on the web this week. Is that One Direction are coming to South Africa? They are in a massive way, and we're going to see huge rivalry, I'm sure, with the, the Bieber fans, or yeah. if they already are, they're Bieber and they're One Direction fans, all, all wrapped up into one. But there's going to be a frenzy tomorrow because tickets go on sale. And it is just the social, social networks have gone ballistic with the news that they're coming. They're only coming next year. But you can just imagine how, what it's going to be like next year, March, April, when they do hit our shores. And then the, the, the other thing is quickly the Rubik's Cube. Yes. Uh, 40th anniversary. I remember I had one when I was yes. a teenager. Never, I could never do it. Oh, my goodness. I've tried as well. And I haven't quite cracked the code. But if you want to um, experiment, if you don't have an, an actual Rubik's Cube, you can go onto Google and you can have a look at their doodle, the Rubik's Cube doodle. And yeah. um, it is just, it's phenomenal. And I'm sure productivity in the office and at home just went down. This, on that day. This you know <laughs> what I used to do? What I used to do, Tegan, I used to take it, break it apart, uh -huh. and then put it physically, stick it back together oh, in yeah, the right way. So I, I would look like I knew what I was doing, but oh, I, I never had a clue. I could only get one face. I could never get the box. <laughs> I broke it apart and then show my brothers, look, I fixed it. Very inventive, though. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> before, well before social media, so I couldn't go do the doodle and all that sort of stuff to find out how to do it. But Tegan, sure. thank you for joining us this morning. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. That's our digital news update, of course. SABC Digital News. There you get all the very best stuff online. Let's take a second look at what you're talking about on social media. Of course, you can send us your views at SABC Newsroom. Ritzang Kitpule says, South Africans can do more to secure Corky's unconditional release. Free Corky now. Robin Felix, if our government pays Corky's ransom, this will become a common thing because the government will then always have to pay. Roland says, Corky's kidnappers didn't think this kidnapping thing through. Who did they think will pay that ransom? T says, what does our government even do to try help have Corky released? Why they call you 83? I can't believe these idiots still have Pierre Corky. Bring back our man. It's been a year. That's right. It's, it will be a year on Tuesday next week. Let's have a look at our Facebook page now. We, you know, we love to interact with you. So on our Facebook page is where you can really get in touch with us. KwaZulu Natal has become the second province to have e-tolls. We also see that organizations involved in fighting rhino poaching have been asked to register their initiatives. And we have a video on the page of the American ballet stars who will be coming to South Africa soon. Remember, we'll have that. Uh, we'll have a little insert on that a bit later. Then, the wife of Pierre Corky, the South African teacher who was kidnapped by Al Qaeda militants in the Yemen last year, has once again asked for the group to release her husband with the help from the gift of the givers. She released this video yesterday. Let's have a look back. Well, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, uh, we'll have a look at the ballet stars that are, well, due in South Africa soon. Don't go away. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. South Africans survived 2014. Many of us actually were given bursaries by state-owned enterprises, but the state shrunk, telecom was privatized, and now you are sitting with huge unemployed people, but huge backlogs in terms of infrastructure that could develop the same young people. 
it's in our hands and our future is up to us. It's a tough year and tough decisions will have to be made by the government. Uh, it's an election year which makes it difficult to make tough decisions. I mean, it's tough to make tough decisions. <laughs> it's especially tough in an election year. That's Rights and Recourse, Sundays 2 p.m. on SABC News. Dumelang Kunjani Nda. Salamu alaikum. Koyamore. Namaste. Jumbo Africa. And a very warm welcome to SABC News Channel 404. South African Revenue Service has upheld its impressive record of collecting taxes. So it's collected about 86 billion rand more in the fiscal year compared to the previous year. The message we want to communicate is that government must also live modestly and uh, that when we're looking at these sorts of issues, uh, modesty is an important message to, to communicate uh, to, to the public. That's AM News, daily at 10 a.m. on SABC News. SABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. Welcome back. At Newsroom on SABC News, let's take a look at the top stories. Government says it has preparations well in hand for Jacob Zuma's second inauguration as president of the country. The ceremony will take place at the Union Buildings in Pretoria on Saturday. Yesterday, Zuma was elected unopposed as president of the country by the new National Assembly. He was the only nominee for the position. A Johannesburg Labour Court judge has been praised for efforts in persuading mine workers union AMCU and platinum producers to start a new round of talks at an undisclosed location. Previous interventions and months of talks have failed with the party still far apart. Talks began yesterday and will continue until tomorrow. Bafana Bafana coach Gordon Niggerson has lamented having international friendlies for his team on days that are not FIFA sanctioned. This after he was forced to make four more changes to his squad for the Australasian tour because of the unavailability of his replacements. Now, let's go back to Parliament quickly. New cleats on the block. The economic freedom fighters caused a stir in the National Assembly and some provincial legislatures yesterday at the wearing of, mem of members of Parliament and members of the provincial legislatures. EFF members arrived at various uh, legislatures in red overalls. Proceedings were delayed at the Gauteng legislature after security guards received instructions not to allow any EFF men members into the legislature wearing party regalia. Let's go to uh, Lucanio Calata, who is in Cape Town with one, well, with the leader who is there. Thank you, Lucanio. Yeah, but, uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the economic freedom fighters have made quite a splash in Parliament, gave it a little bit of colour yesterday. Uh, when we spoke earlier on, I uh, had mentioned to you how when they came in, they were almost treated uh, as, as rock stars as uh, they walked around and with everybody wanting uh, to take a picture or even a selfie with them. But to tell me a little bit more about uh, the party and uh, obviously yesterday's dress code, I am now joined by the party's uh, national spokesperson, Mbuse Nindlozi. Uh, Mr. Nindlozi, thank you very much for joining us uh, and, and good morning. Tell us a little bit about the decision by the party yesterday to come to the National Assembly dressed in your red overalls. I thank you for having me. The, the, the logic uh, was uh, to be able to um, find the dress code that uh, the ordinary workers in South Africa that make this country be what it is can identify with so that they can say there I am. Those ones are part of us. That's why we, we took the, the mine workers' dress codes, the domestic workers' dress codes, because also what we are about is economic emancipation and economic freedom. We wanted to send that message very clear uh, in the symbolism, in the symbolic representation uh, of, uh, the parliamentary, of the parliamentarians. So now you're here. You, most of you guys, or almost all of you guys, were sworn in yesterday. And now we get down to the business of Parliament. For the next five years, what can we expect from the EFF? A very, a very robust debate. I think we must identify, we must appreciate that uh, the, the EFF is the most of the radical parties. Uh, in fact, I think it's the only radical party. Everybody in this parliament agrees, uh, particularly about the macroeconomic frameworks that have constituted running South Africa's economy for the past 20 years 
years even going forward. They've all agreed on the uh, National Development Plan, uh, which is a neoliberal, it's, 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 it's a continuation of uh, a neoliberal governmentality, neoliberal marketization, uh, and, uh, and the EFF is different. So we will be raising sharp debates that have to do in the final analysis with the economic emancipation of our people. We'll put our manifesto demands uh, to the House, uh, uh, minimum wage, nationalization of mines, land expropriation, uh, uh, and all other things that we've been talking about leading up towards the elections. All right. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. Yeben, well, there you have it for yourself. The EFF saying that they're going to be very, very radical over the next five years. From us in Parliament, over to you guys in Johannesburg. Thanks very much, uh, Locanio. Of course, yes, it'll make Locanio's job a lot more interesting in the months to come. Now, next month, the stars of American Ballet will be heading to South Africa. Quite an historic event. Our producer, Katrin Milan, has more. Thank you, Eben. Yes, for the first time in over 30 years, a company of American ballet stars will bring their unique brand of classical ballet brilliance to South African stage. When the stars of the American ballet come to the Teatro at Monte Cassino next month, the stars of American ballet hail from such distinguished companies as the New York City Ballet, American Ballet Theatre, Boston Ballet, and other distinguished American ballet companies. Presented by ballet entrepreneur Dirk Bardenos, who joins us today in studio. Dirk, welcome. Thank Thank you very much and good morning. <laughs> I want to start off with just I understand this is a very historic event. It is indeed. It has been a very, very long time since we've had dancers from America in, in such force in South Africa at Monte Cassino. And um, the stars include principal dancer Joaquim de Luz from New York City Ballet, who's putting the, the group together. Um, I saw two years ago a beautiful pas de deux by George Balanchine in Cuba, and so it was my dream to bring that to South Africa. So South Africans will be seeing that as part of the lineup. We're doing the um, uh, Who Cares Suite. So it's, it's slightly different from the other ballets uh, or galas that I've done before because there's not just a, a range of big classical pas de deux, but it's also got group numbers. There's a new uh, contemporary choreography by the granddaughter of Ernst de Jong, who will be doing his 80th exhibition on his 80th birthday at the Monte Cassino, and he will have designed the backdrops for, for some of the ballets that we will be seeing that night. So Andy Shermerly, his granddaughter, has choreographed a, a contemporary piece for um, herself and Anna Lucasio, who was a dancer with Cedar Lake in New York. So it's a really, really great lineup of dancers. Michael the Prince is coming back, whom we know as a, an African orphan who is now doing ex exceptionally well in, 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 in Holland with Dutch National Ballet. Another dancer who's American or from Mexico, uh, Isaac Hernandez Fernandez, is coming to dance in South Africa as well. So it really is a great lineup. One of the first time that we're having a, an Indian dancer, uh, Amara Masar, also from New York City Ballet, is coming to South Africa. So it is a fantastic lineup of dancers coming to Monte Cassino. Just going to be burning the stage, as they say in America. Um, mm. Our sets are these big LED screens, which we've never done for, for ballet in South Africa, to kind of tie in with the um, American theme. And the dancers are so excited about coming to South Africa, and, we, and we're tying it in with rhino conservation by going to perform at a, at a venue where we, there's a rhino orphanage. And it's just great to see the excitement coming from America and the South Africans starting to become excited about them being here. Just tell us a bit more about the director. Uh, Joaquim de Luz is uh, uh, the boyfriend of Andrea Shermerly and a good friend of mine whom I'd met two years ago in New York. A principal dancer with New York City Ballet, dancing exceptionally That's well. That's him we're looking at right That's now. That's exactly him. He's from Spain actually originally, but as I say, principal dancer with New York City Ballet. And he has put together a really, really great group of, of friends. And we had to, to get special permission from the George Balanchine Trust to be able to do the two ballets that we are doing. Um, and that's also great for us to be, to be known around the world now. So more people are becoming aware of, of ballet in South Africa, of the company in South Africa, of the work that we are doing. And they then take some of those things back. So we also have little Leroy Mokhatli, a young dancer from South Africa who just won the bronze medal at the Youth American Grand Prix big ballet competition in New York. He will be doing a solo in, in, in the gala because I, I feel it's important that we, we also share the, the, the talent that comes here with talent here, taking stuff back there. And Kitty Petla, also from South Africa, will also be part of the lineup. But the, 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 the bulk of the, of the program are completely, completely our stars from America. Why has it taken 30 years for something like this to happen now? Well, I think it's difficult sometimes to bring things like this together. It's timing, it's money, it's, it's knowing the right people, and it just fortuitously all came together right now and, I, and I'm, I've been working on these kind of pro programs now for the last four or five years and so I was lucky to, to find the dancers 
this is their their summer holiday in the, in the United States, mm. so it works out perfectly. And for they're the all pretty visit. excited coming to South Africa. Super excited, <laughs> and they really really excited. And we're doing a project where they will be dancing with some of our, our young kids from our development program, learning African dance, nice. and they will then teach our youngsters some classical ballet. Then just to wrap, just tell, give us the details if people want to go see the ballet and everything. It's being shown at Monte Cassino from the 20th to the 22nd of June. Tickets are at Monte Cassino or at CompuTicket, so please make sure you get your tickets as quickly as possible. It is selling exceptionally well, so we're really excited about it. Dirk, thank you so much for joining us, and of course we'll have the details up on our Facebook page. That was Dirk Bardenort, the ballet entrepreneur in South Africa, and I understand you're also going to the inauguration this I'm weekend. I'm indeed very excited about it, because <laughs> I've never been, and I just think it's important that we, we become part and we bring arts and culture back into the government. Ivan, mm -hmm. back to you. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant venue at Monte Cassino. I've been there. I love it. Teatro, fantastic, and it should be a fantastic show. That's where we end at News Rupees, broadcast live from our studios here in Auckland Clark, Johannesburg. That is in South Africa, if you're not watching within our borders. We're also streaming live on YouTube between 9 and 10 a.m. weekdays, with our whole show then available on our YouTube channel. This is SABC News. You have been watching Newsroom. We love it in the morning. Adam Habib, Director of Human Sciences Research Council Democracy and Government's Research Program, may be a born Muslim, but his life has not always been about following on the path of Islam. While religion may be a personal choice, many of us are often born into it, seldom venturing from the path we're being taught to follow. Others go looking for more meaningful answers. Adam Habib is one such individual who, after being reared into a close-knit Muslim community, went in search of a better understanding of his life and purpose on earth. Uh, Islam played a very different role. For the first 17, 18 years, Islam uh, played a fairly important part in my life, partly because I grew up in a Muslim home. I, I wasn't a Muslim because uh, I wanted to be or I thought it was good to be one. I, I was a Muslim because I was born in a Muslim home. I had a father and mother who made, made sure I went to madrasa. Uh, they whacked me if I didn't read the mas, uh, all of that kind of stuff. When I was 18, 19, I got fairly politically active. I got involved in the anti-apartheid movement. And in that movement, uh, I, w I became quite conscious about how mainstream Muslim organization and mainstream Muslim leaders uh, related to the anti-apartheid struggle. At that stage, in the mid-80s, late early 80s, people refused to be party to the anti-apartheid struggle. They said uh, that segregation was appropriate. A lot of them said we shouldn't get involved in uh, fighting the government, that you live in this country, therefore you must be supportive of that regime. They never took to heart uh, what the Quran said about fighting oppression, etc. And so I really got turned off of, of it in quite a dramatic way. Uh, and and I, I blamed uh, main, the Muslim leaders I, and I saw Muslim leaders as being typical of what Islam says about these issues. So for 18 years, I, I wouldn't say I became an atheist, I, I would argue I became agnostic. At about 35, 36, by the way, I, my, my, after my first son was born, uh, two or three years later, uh, I got fairly ill. And basically, I had an ulcer. So, uh, you know, I suddenly started thinking about God. And I thought, how, how, how hypocritical. And I started, re I started again. I started reading the Mars, but this time around, I started coming to it in a different way. I came to it not because I was forced to, but because I started to think these things. And I began to start asking crucial questions that I had never asked before, or had answered in different ways. How do you understand takbir and takdeer? How do you understand destiny and faith, while simultaneously responsibility? And I began to understand 
that actually none of us can understand divine law. The purpose of divine law is because man cannot understand it. Human, humanity cannot. We can try and, and figure out the rules, but we truly cannot understand it. So therefore, somebody who is born into poverty and somebody who is born into richness will be judged differently. And they can only be judged differently by, by a divine being. Uh, they can't be judged differently by human beings because human beings have to have consistency in their, in their legal practice. I think every day is a battle to try and understand more of Islam and to integrate it into my life. Adam is a human rights activist whose work and faith go hand in hand. While he seeks to constantly challenge and change the thoughts and policies of different aspects in society, be it government, education or religion, he remains true to the fundamental principles and teachings of Islam as he interprets it. Islam is not about the rituals. The rituals are, man are simply a manifestation of a broader fundamental goal. Islam is about love of humanity. Islam is about freedom. It's about constantly striving to free humanity of oppression and freedom, to create a space for humanity to flower, to create space for life. And, 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 and the most important thing you can do in, in, in Islam for me is love people, but also uh, allow life to happen. My work is about uh, research. And my research is about creating an enabling environment for humanity as a whole. Not for Muslims, for everybody. Uh, to, to create a way, uh, an enabling environment for development. To get, create an enabling environment for democracy and all of these things. And these are all fundamental elements of, 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 of Islam. Communication between ourselves and our Creator is essential if we want to make sense of our purpose and function on Earth. Prayer is often used to do this, but there are many other ways we can look at it. Well, I present my Islam as being going beyond rituals. Uh, and that's where I think it's, it's simply more spiritual. I think everybody has a different spiritual element. Uh, but the spiritual element for me is how do you commune with God? How do you link up with God? And it seems to me that you could use multiple experiences to, to achieve the same end. Right. For me, it's the end result that counts. And how you get to the end result is, is different. This is where I think Sufism starts. Uh, it's not so much about the rituals. You can look, you look at multiple rituals. You know, Rumi is about poetry. It's about song and it's about dance. There's a lot of Islamic scholars who tell you, well, that's not allowed, you know? But, but that's how, he, commu uh, that's how he, he communicated. And it seems to me that, for me, that's the spiritual element about it, is how do you ultimately Get your heart to sink in with nature. Get your heart to commune with God. In any 